my name is Andrea. I'm from Eurus Education. We're a law school admissions consulting firm committed to helping ambitious pre-law students get accepted to the nation's most prestigious institutions. Um, we're absolutely passionate about what we do and breaking down higher education barriers and just providing legal professionals, or I should say aspiring legal professionals with the expert insights, which is why we do these webinars here today. So as Christina, who will introduce herself a little bit more shortly, um, did say is we have another panelist. He's having some type of technical difficulties, but he will hop on shortly. Um, this webinar is recorded and you will receive a copy of this in your inbox within the next couple of days. So if you have to back out, we understand that you'll have access to watch the remainder, remainder of the webinar. We have a question and answer chat box for you and we will get back to some of the questions at the end. So the webinar is looking at to be run between four to five minutes and an hour, depending on how many questions we get. The first section will be dedicated to topic at hand. So deciding what law schools to apply to, and then we can hop into your question and your answers. Um, well, your questions and our answers. Um, I'm not, I don't think I'm missing anything. I think that's just a little housekeeping for everybody. Um, I think we're ready to go, Christina. I'm going to turn off my camera and let you do your thing. I'm here if you need me. Okay, so deciding what law schools to apply to, um, we have an agenda and it's just understanding your priorities, researching law school programs, tailoring your application strategy, narrowing down your choices, and then finally q and A. I'll be going through some slides. When Andrew joins, he'll also be going through the slides with me. Please, please, you can write your questions in as you have them in the chat and we can get to it at the Q&A um, session at the end. We don't want you to forget your questions um, and we'll just answer everything on the back end. So let's begin. So understanding your priorities. When you think about, when you're thinking about applying to law school, it's a very expensive process. There's a lot of essays, a lot to, um, a lot to kind of juggle at one time. You're already putting together an application, you're taking exams. So as you're thinking about what schools you wanna to go to, considering this is such an expensive undertaking and it's gonna take some time and commitment and you're gonna be living in this city for three years, you wanna reflect on what your career goals are. Where do you see yourself in the legal field? Do you wanna to go to big law? work for a big corporation? Do you want to work for the government? What kind of law do you want to do? And you don't have to have the answer to that question because a lot of people don't. But if you do, that definitely is something that you should be prioritizing in your school choice. Another thing that you should prioritize is location preferences, urban versus rural, proximity to legal markets. So I'm sure a lot of you, um, have seen like law school rankings and people thinking a lot about, okay, this school is ranked here or this school is more, um, it's, it's prestigious. But when you think about some of the schools who maybe aren't as high on a ranking list, a lot of them have really strong geographical ties. And so they can be, hi, Andrew, how are you? So Good. we're on the understanding your priorities, just the first slide. Um, I'm talking about location preferences and how important it is to pick a location that fits your goals, somewhere that you can live for three years, mm -hmm. um, or maybe see yourself working after, and maybe not attaching too much importance on ranking or the or the prestige of a law school, um, and and think about location maybe just a little bit more, because especially because a lot of schools who have strong geographical ties or a lot of people in that legal market came from those schools might prioritize those ties as opposed to rankings that you see online. Um, the next bullet point, budget considerations, that's super important. How much does it cost? How much does an apartment cost? What it would look like to get you from point A to point B? 
I uh, grew up in New York City and I remember applying to law schools in California. And this was mid pandemic and I was super excited, but logistically when it came down to planning a move halfway across the country and not to even think about the pandemic, it just felt less and less feasible for me. And so when you're thinking about like moving, think about those kind of um those challenges that might come up. And and finally, and most importantly, academic and cultural fit. Seeking an environment where you'll thrive, where there are communities that are supportive, um, learning more about the school community, meeting people from those schools. I think that's probably the one of the biggest um, considerations or priorities that you should think about when choosing a law school. Andrew, any comments? No, uh, Christina, and from what you're saying, I think these are all very valid and important considerations. I added some stuff in the later slides that I feel like are, are going to expand on what this is a bit, but I feel like this is an excellent jumping off point, so I don't really have much to add right now. Okay, awesome. Um, you can take the next slide. Sure. Oh, sorry. So, yeah, so this is, I think, fairly boilerplate, so I'm going to add as I see fit, but researching law programs, you know, this is a very important first step in the process. So, you know, as the slide says, like, Start broadly. You don't want to pigeonhole yourself to, you know, it, obviously it is important to consider where you want to work and where you want to study, but, you know, tying anything too importantly to say a ranking or, you know, maybe one of your parents or peers, like conception of school can be quite a mistake because you don't know how things are perceived now. So, you know, using resources wisely is also very important. So LSAC is a good way to start full school websites and alumni feet alumni feedback. I'll also add that if, say, if you're still in college, I don't know how old everyone is on this call and where they are educationally, it can be helpful to talk to your school's pre-law department. I know some schools have them more helpful than others, but for just exploring law schools and programs and, you know, hearing what people from your school have done, it can be an excellent resource. There are some other things I'll say about them that not aren't necessarily as positive, but I think just exploring law schools and see what your options are, I think they're very important. Additionally, you know, focusing on specifics, you know, a lot of people get lost in the weeds and sort of treat researching law programs as like an extension of their undergraduate experience, which is not necessarily the best idea. Undergraduate experiences can be very diverse and very helpful. And you could argue the goals of them are beyond just merely acquiring some sort of position after. I think law as a field is more professionally oriented. So certain things like, I don't know, a really pretty gym or a rock climbing wall is examples of any university should probably not be as important in your search for a law school unless you really want to go to rock climb, which I guess is more power to you. But you know, as, this, as it says here, like programs in your field, you know, the faculty, if you're really, really interested in one particular thing, like for me per personally, I'm interested in antitrust law. So say going to school in New York or DC, or you can intern with, you know, a state attorney general's office or in DC, like a government office during the year could be really beneficial to get practical experience in the field. So if you're looking to do something, I don't know, as a public defender, like looking for schools to have good networks and good faculty, as well as good placement in those fields is absolutely critical. Bar passage breaks. This is a big one. Every year, you know, I'll see people going to a school that frankly like less than half the people pass the bar i think the aba requires a 75 percent bar pass rate after two years in order to stay accredited but sometimes like you want to make sure you're going to a school where people are competent enough to stay in and pass and if it's not like that if it's at the very very bottom of that your state or your locality for bar passage you really want to have a critical lie because you don't want to fail the bar after three years of law school and employment outcomes and i think Arguably, this is the most important part of you know, choosing a law school, probably more than anything else, except for maybe debt. Like, you don't want to go to a law school and figure out a couple of years in that the job you want is very hard to achieve in there. And as Christina said, like, you want to go to school that has, you want to go to big law, but you're only 10% of kids from your school are going to big law. You better be at the top of your class, and it's not super easy to predict that. So you want to make sure that you're going to a school that will help you achieve your goals, even if you're not the top student there. So it's definitely a matter of balancing these considerations and, and figuring out, you know, what works for you and with the, a reasonable amount of effort. Christina, do you have anything else to add? 
Um, yeah, I think what you said, I 1000% agree with. And I think something mm -hmm. that really helped me that's on this list um, is the alumni feedback. I think when mm -hmm. I um, was applying to schools or starting to get into schools, what really helped with my decision factor or just kind of thinking about what would make sense for me is just tapping into the alumni network um, and seeing what their opinions were of the schools they went to, um, what they participated in, what they're doing now, and you know how they felt that school prepared them for what they're doing. And that was some of the most helpful feedback ever. And sometimes you'll get extra tidbits of just help or information that you maybe weren't even looking for that they'll pour into you. Um, that will be super helpful for your law school journey and for your future career. So I think um, I agree with everything, but I think really think about reaching out to some alumni. Honestly, when I did it, I just went on LinkedIn and found someone who looked friendly and reached out. <laughs> um, but you could always, you know, reach out to the school. They definitely have alumni networks who would happily reach out to you and ha and talk to you. And so um, that's definitely a great resource. Sure. Uh, Christina, I think I'm good with this slide. So you good to go on to the next one? Awesome. Great. So analyzing law schools. Um, so I know that a lot, when I applied for law school, I think rankings mm -hmm. were a big thing and they probably are still a big thing. And I think people put a lot of emphasis on the rankings as it pertains you know, to job placement, the prestige, and rankings do measure some things, um, but I'm not sure if you guys have been following some of the news, like in terms of like how arbitrary that could be, or maybe not, you know, analyzing the right things or not having the right system in place. And on one side, right, if there's a national publication saying these are the best law schools, obviously there might be some perception in terms of like maybe the legal market or other people who might say, well, maybe they are, you know, the best law schools. Mm -hmm. But again, when it, when it comes to real ties to the legal community that you want to join or real um, ties to the type of job you want to have, that's something that the alumni can really show you when we think about, again, if you're thinking about a school that's a T14 school or a T20 school, but if you look at a school that's in T50 or T30, depending on where you wanna live or the work you wanna do, a school that's lower ranked might be cheaper for you and better positioned to get you the job or the career that you wanna do. And so it's really important to really balance those ideals between prestige and maybe what appears to be what you want and what actually will be what you want and gets you to where you want to be long term. And as someone who understands how expensive law school can be, as affordable as possible. <laughs> um, and so again, you want to consider rankings as one factor, but it's not the whole story. You're looking for, again, the quality of the program, the fit of the program. How would you fit into this program? Because it could be ranked, you know, top 10 and you don't have a great time and it's not what you're looking for. And so it's important to pay for something that fits for you. Mm -hmm. Andrew? Yeah. Yeah. So I added that little tidbit after the, the first bullet point. So my big pet peeve with the U.S. News ranking is the fact that they're so arbitrary, as Christina said, and they change every year. Especially this year, they have the weight of the LSAT and GP in rankings, and they increase their employment score as a component of the rankings by a lot to make it the number one factor, I think almost 60%. So, you know, ostensibly, it's something, oh, it looks great. They're caring about more employment and less about, like, the LSAT and the GPA. But they don't, the U.S. News does a, not a great job at differentiating what kinds of legal employment you're going to get. You know, to, to the U.S. News ranking, someone getting a big law job or an amazing government job at the DOJ is treated pretty much the same as someone who gets a job at a small firm or a local agency. Not to say that those are poor options, but if you're looking to have work at big law or work as a federal clerk, perhaps, and then go to the government, you know, a school... My my example is the University of Minnesota. It's ranked 16th in a country. Is University of Minnesota, I'm sure, a fine law school? Sure, nothing bad about it. But to say that it is, it's it's 
reaches primarily in Minnesota and the Midwest. So if you're going to University of Minnesota over, say, Wash U Law, which is a little bit lower, but it has a much more national reach solely because of its ranking, you're probably making a mistake unless you want to work near where that school is. So I think you, you have to really consider that rankings aren't everything. And it's such a big pet peeve of mine. You know, I'm applying for law schools right now. And every time I would get into school, my parents tell me, first thing, what's it ranked? And I'm like, mom and dad, like, it, it doesn't matter that much. That's not what I'm looking for, you know? So it's like people, you know, especially if you're conferring with family and friends, there's going to be, might be some pressure to be like, oh, well, this school is ranked high. I got to go here. But it's like, you have to look beyond it. And I can suggest it and write it in chat, but above the law, they have their rankings every year. Those are another interesting ranking that takes into account the debt your graduates receive and the quality of legal jobs that people get. And I think it's another useful thing to look at beyond the US news. All right, uh, anything else, Rashina, or? No. Nope. All right, I will move on to the next slide and take this one. Awesome. All right, so location and its importance. You know, they say location, 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 and it is no different for law schools. You know, beyond like financial considerations, this is probably the most important part of choosing a law school. You know, so as you know, the first bullet point says, and as I, I iterated earlier, like you want to go to the school that you can get internships at easily for whatever you want to do. And obviously interests change through law school. So you do want to give yourself flexibility to not be dead set on a path, which is very important. And job opportunities post-graduation. So there, there are a couple ways to discern this. Talking to alumni is definitely one of them, seeing what they do. There are also these things called uh, NALP reports, and I can write that in the chat too. And Anthony, yes, it is called NL Above the Law. I want to write this in the chat because I think it was really useful to me. Not all schools publish them, but some do. And if you don't have them, you can also do 509 reports. These sort of tabulate the data of where people are working after law school. So it'll divide it up into firms, how big they are, how much they pay, and for government agencies, are they going into businesses or academia? I found these really, really useful because, you know, this stuff is sort of obfuscated if you're looking at just a ranking. So you want to do your research. I know I'm going a little bit tangential, but they also do tell you where people are practicing. And to segue to the next point, like your lifestyle and cost of living, this really patches into how hot you are and how much debt you want to take. You know, if you want to work in California, but you want to work in LA, you might want to go to UCLA over Berkeley. It's a little bit cheaper. Sure, it's expensive, but Berkeley is insanely expensive. That's just one example. But you want to make sure that you're you're doing things sensibly. And unless it's extremely beneficial, you, you kind of you know, it's always good to limit that. I mean, unless you're a multimillionaire, in which case, why are you going to law school? You probably wouldn't be on this call. So, and the last one I think is very important as well. You, It's very helpful to think about where you want to work after graduation. So as an example, North Carolina, I say this because it's a state that has several pretty good law schools, but with different sorts of research. Like if you want to work in North Carolina and you know, you want to go to, say you got into Duke with no scholarship money, UNC, UNC with almost full tuition and, and Wake Forest with a full ride. But you just want to work at any law firm in North Carolina, good firm, you know, don't care about big law. I would go to UNC or Wake Forest over Duke. I wouldn't take up the money. Now, if you want to work in big law in North Carolina or say in Atlanta or DC, Duke might be a better bet. You know, this is the kind of stuff that the 509 reports will really elucidate to you. But, and going to that last point, most law schools are regional. Like Harvard and Yale, you can get a job anywhere, amazing job, you know, regardless yeah. of what you want to do. But even schools in the top 14, you know, like Berkeley, a lot, most of are graduates practice in California after. And Georgetown, as another example, most of them work in D.C. That's not to say you can't, you know, go far with those schools away, but... It, it's advantageous to go to a school that's close to you want to work, even if it's ranked high because of just the alumni and the employers and the connections you're going to get, you know? So it's, it's a very useful consideration as, and as you go farther down in the rankings, this becomes even more important. Like you don't want to be, you know, you don't want to be paying a lot of money for a school and you want to practice halfway across the country that, and it's, not ranked that high and you know sure it's placed on this good in your own legal market but if you apply to somewhere you know see you go to fordham law and you want to apply for a job 
a job in California, like they're not going to think of Fordham law over the multitude of law schools that already are in California. So it, these are just, and again, it, I know people's considerations change and wants, but, and that's part of why flexibility is important, but you want to have this good idea, at least a ballpark of, Hey, I kind of want to be here in this region at your graduation. Anything else, Christina? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think something else. So, something else that I would um, mm -hmm. say, right, is that maybe you don't know where you want to live after law school. Maybe you don't know, you know, what you want to do after law school. Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking about law schools, you're maybe going on the broader. Okay, let me pick a school that looks like it'll be a great fit. I get along with some of the alumni. I could see myself living in this city, but I don't know, you know, mm -hmm. then maybe taking the splurge and maybe paying for a higher ranked program that might have not more national um, mm -hmm. exposure might be a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe you're like, you know what? I grew up in a small town. I went to college in another small town, or but I want to try a different city. Maybe I want to live in New York. Maybe I want to live in Texas. Maybe I want to live somewhere else. But I'm not saying that you shouldn't apply to law schools in that area and, and test it out, especially if you want to go to a school, you know, that has more national exposure. Mm -hmm. um, but just as Andrew said, if that is not the case, if you know you want to be in a certain legal market and you're getting scholarships to a school that's in that legal market, that will definitely be the better fit for you. Mm -hmm. And as someone who has done um, a lot of big law internships over the course of my three years in law school, um, going back to the example of Wake Forest, there are a lot of people um, um, Duke, Wake Forest, a lot of people at Wake Forest in New York working big law jobs who were able to do that. And I think the biggest differentiating factor is maybe the percentages of the class who are going to big law, mm -hmm. what they're looking for, kind of what Andrew said, is it the top 10%, top 15%, whereas Duke might be, you know, maybe easier to get your foot in through the door. So it's one of those decisions you have to make based on, you know, what's important to you. Is it, you know, may, maybe a more affordable experience? Is it maybe giving yourself all of the options after law school because you're mm -hmm. just not sure? And it's okay not to be sure. And it's okay to say, okay, maybe I wanna go to a school that's more nationally recognized so that when I graduate, I could just head across the country and have an okay shot of getting a job, even if it's not as good as maybe a regional school, mm -hmm. you know, but you'll, you'll definitely have a better shot with maybe one with more national recognitions in a regional school where they, most of their power is in that region. That being said, um, that being said, I think law school is what you make of it. And once you get there, the networking that you do, the connections that you make will be what ultimately takes you where you want to be. And I think also, the, um, the the example you said about Fordham and trying to get a job in California, Fordham mm -hmm. is a great school and a lot of firms on the East Coast would be happy to have a Fordham graduate. Mm -hmm. But going to Fordham, it's easier to get to other cities in the East Coast or easier to get to the, the big law firm just in midtown Manhattan, where it's harder to get on a flight, you know, to mm -hmm. California to meet people in person. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can always set up a Zoom call, but it's just, it's harder. It's a three hour difference. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just takes more time, more effort to kind of make those connections. And so just think about it in that sense. And the world is your oyster. You can make any decision that you want, but just make it make sense. Yeah. All righty. Okay, program offerings and specializations. Um, again, this is for people who might have an idea of what their interests are, if you're just kind of an open slate. Um, these are still important, but um, maybe not as important as like, I need to have this clinic. I need to have this journal. I need to have this program. But a lot of law schools have some really great programs um, that make them really special places, especially if you're interested in a very specific type of law. They might not have the best ranking or the best reputation in all law, but they have a really good reputation in one type of law, or they have faculty expertise in one type of law, or their externship opportunities where they're located is spectacular, or they have legal clinics where you get to work with real clients and you know kind of start out during law school. 
you know, working as an attorney. So it's important to look at what these law schools are offering. Um, if you do want to go into academia, I know academia, a lot of people tend to go, um, you know, to certain schools, but, you know, what kind of academic opportunities are there? Who can you work with? What that looks like for you? So it's definitely maybe not something um, that you're going to eliminate half of the schools on your list for, because a lot of the schools have clinics and those things, but really think about what they're offering, what might be interested, interesting to you, um, and take that into account. Andrew? Yeah, so that I added that um, the sub point after that first bullet. The reason I write that is because sometimes you'll see on these glossy brochures you get in the mail, these emails, like, this school is ranked number three in some esoteric legal field, you know, like, I don't know, environmental law. That's my example. Not to say it's esoteric, but that, that's just what's on my head because I'm going to talk about it a little bit later. So these things, if you're not really well versed in the, you know, how law schools work, it'd be like, oh, great. You know, the school is not so highly ranked, but it has a great program. So these things are kind of based schools will manipulate data to make up these sorts of lists for th themselves, not even based off of US news rankings. Sometimes they'll do it. So in their own like, weird methodology, they're number one in this. But if what they don't tell you is that it could be based off things as arcane as just professor publications and a really specific subject and not necessarily things that are really important, like, you know, what kinds of environmental law jobs are people getting and where are they working? So my example is Pace Law. I'm from Westchester. I live in Westchester County, New York, and Pace is right down the road from me. They're known for their environmental law program. I know they have a couple of internships and connections that make it, apparently it is actually one of those that is not some, it's not like a scam, but it is a part of it. So if you're interested in environmental law, like going to Pace Law could be a good idea, but you don't want to take out a lot of debt to do so. You know, if you want to take a full ride and you're like, you understand that environmental law can be challenging to get into and that, you know, you're probably not going to make as much money as a big law associate. That's great. And if you get a big scholarship or pays, like more power to you. But what you want to avoid is to see one of these specialty rankings and not research it enough. And then, you know, God forbid you take out a lot of loans and then you realize that it's all a facade and like it's, it's not as what it, you thought it was going to be. And that can be a very, very challenging hole to dig yourself out of. So you really want to, you know, this is for talking to alumni is really helpful because unfortunately like you're going to talk, schools will promote themselves to be taught to them and they're going to try to do everything in their power to be like, oh, this is great. So as Christina has you know, been saying, like you want to talk to people who've actually gone there and have experienced it to make sure that what they're saying is true. And if it's not like what's different than what they're saying. Exactly. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, ready to go to the next slide? Sure. Yeah. So I will take this one. Wait, am I taking it or you? I'm like, sorry. I, uh, I could take it. I think we were bouncing back and forth, but. All right. Yeah. Understanding the costs. I think this is one of the most important things when you're thinking about law school. Law school can cost like $300,000 plus if you're going no scholarship. And if you have the money, you know, do what works, do it, do what you want, you know, go for it. But. I think not thinking about money will set you back because you won't maybe be able to do what it is you want to do after graduation. You're stuck trying to pay off loans. And I'm not saying if you don't get a scholarship, don't go, but really think closely about who's giving you a scholarship and comparing that to a school who maybe didn't give you a scholarship. Mm -hmm. um, outside of tuition, law school is still very expensive. Fees, books, cost a lot of money and they're huge living expenses and that includes you know you know getting an apartment and I don't know I know that maybe you're an undergrad or I don't know if people are out of work but you, you tend to want to live nearby where you're going all the time and so my first year of law school everyone was trying to like be walking distance of the law school and Northwestern is in the downtown, it's a downtown Chicago where rent is astronomical. So if you if you are thinking about a city, right? And you're like, okay, I wanna go to the city. Maybe rent is not too bad in certain neighborhoods, right? 
fine. But you want to know what the rent is like in the neighborhood which the school is located because mm-hmm. you'll be at the school for long hours. You have to get to class. You'll be in class all day, especially in the beginning. You want to live as close as possible. So you want to factor that into your living expenses and it, you know, it's groceries. It's, you know, if you don't have a gym in your building, you know, or having access to a gym, if your school doesn't have one, you know, so many other things that add up, maybe it's flights back home, you know, maybe, you know, you want to see your family and, um, you know, you want to go to your sister's wedding, different things. You want to be able to get to where you need to be and factor that in. Um, when we think about, um, scholarships and grants and loan options, schools will be very transparent about about if they have like named scholarships, like, oh, we have this scholarship for people who are interested in public interest. We have this scholarship for people who are interested in this, and you can apply directly to those scholarships. If you are interested in public interest or those things, I would suggest that you apply. And that's what makes your selection of schools even more of a big deal because you don't want to apply to 50 schools and not give your attention to the ones that actually matter. You want to you want to apply to schools that you actually want to go to that make sense for you so that you can take time to write those supplemental essays and have them be a, a, a good representation of the candidate you would be going to that school. So if you do want to do, you know, public interest or something in that in that field, you can apply to that scholarship that would, you know, help alleviate some of the burden uh, a paying full price uh, for that school. Um, and, um, and just in a, a last note about managing debt post-graduation, um, I know a lot of schools have programming about that. And that could be a really good question to ask um, the admissions and the people who are pushing you to go to these schools. So what does that look like post-graduation? What kind of programs do you have in place um, again, looking at some of the reports that Andrew mentioned and seeing how much debt people typically leave with. Why is that? Is the school getting, is the school getting donations, but they're not they're not putting it towards scholarships? Like, what are they doing with it? What kind of school am I going to? And and kind of getting and and getting that understanding of of what those school that school's priorities are. Um, yeah. All right. Um, I don't have much else to add, so I'll okay. take this slide. So, campus culture and student life. I'll give a little bit of a preface that to me, this is some people overemphasize it, not that it doesn't matter, but it, compared to things like student debt and programs you want to do, employment, it's, it shouldn't be, it's not quite as big of a factor, but it is something to consider. So, you know, if you're someone that thrives in a collaborative community and you don't want it to be overly competitive, like certain, certain kinds of schools are a bit more competitive than others. From my and from what I've read and what who I've talked to, like it's not necessarily the schools you think. Like some people might think, oh, well, Yale and Harvard are probably the most competitive schools because everyone there is so smart. But sometimes, like at these top schools, like everyone knows at the end of the day that they're going to get the job they want, and they won't have, even if that they're not at the top of the class, like it, you know, they'll have a great option regardless. So those schools, it seems a little bit counterintuitive, but they can be a really supportive community. On the other hand, some schools that are, if you go further down the rankings, like regional schools, schools that have some people getting great positions, but others, if you're like towards the bottom of the class, might be a little bit tougher. Those can get towards more of a little bit of a stereotypical competitiveness. I mean, you know, most people will generally say that the law schools are pretty collegial and supportive, but you do just want to watch out for places where it can get difficult because, you know, the, the whole stories about ripping textbooks, uh, pages out of textbooks in the library, I think are a bit overblown, but you just want to make sure you're in a place where you really feel you fit in and you can make friends and you know, that that can be achieved by visiting and just talking to alumni. Yeah, and then for extracurriculars, you know, moot court, law review, like student organizations, like if you want to go be a litigator and you want to work in, you know, the federal government or for a firm or, you know, for a like a high impact, like public interest organization, like moot court, mock trial, law review, et cetera, can be very helpful in distinguishing yourself beyond mere grades, you know? And as for student organizations, like say you want to, you want to be a public defender, like joining a public defense clinic, your second year law school is a great way to signal to like these agencies, like, hey, I'm committed to this. So you want to make sure you're going to a school that not only like has people going to the jobs you want, but you know, when you're there, you'll be able to involve yourself in all these opportunities that like you can distinguish yourself from the other people who want to do it. 
know, I think that's a really big consideration. And you know, work-life balance, I'm going to hold resources. I am not in law school yet, and Christina is, so I'm sure she could speak much more than me on the how to manage work-life balance in law school and mental health resources. But yeah, I can defer to you if you want, Christina, if you want to explain it more. Yeah, we can, I can definitely um, take work-life balance and mental health resources. So first year law school is a true grind. Um, it's a true grind. And like Andrew said, if you're maybe going to a lower ranked school where people are kind of fighting to be in that top 10% or top 15% to get certain jobs, it can get more competitive where it's not maybe, you know, as like a super collaborative community because people know it's kind of me or you. Um, and so that's one consideration and maybe seeing what the school has in terms of resources for work for mental health resources i think it will take a toll on you wherever you go truly um but even at maybe higher ranked schools it still takes a toll the stress of you know having to learn a new way of thinking the stress of you know maybe moving to a new city if you do um you know trying to grasp the material i'm sure a lot of people who go to law school have been really good at school for their whole lives. And then you come to law school and maybe you're not understanding it. You're not, and, or maybe it's taking you a while, you know, to understand it. And that can be stressful in and of itself. And then outside of just like things that happen at school, you know, you can have family issues, you know, your own personal mental health issues. So it's important to talk to the school, the admissions, the deans that are there. That is their job to tell you what that looks like. and. Uh, my first year at Northwestern, we've had people who experienced deaths, who had their own mental health crises, who had ec had extra things going on in their life where they needed um, accommodations, whether it was, okay, this is a really difficult time, we can postpone this final, you'll take it a month later, or okay, we can um, figure out how to give you whatever accommodation you need, or we have a counselor who will check in with you, or um we have someone i think and this goes into accommodations to outside of just mental health resources if you have a disability having someone type your notes for you there are things that schools out there are doing um to help make things easier um having food um in the general areas just to make sure that if you have any questions someone's out there and people can hang out and you're not feeling isolated especially if you don't really have too many friends in that new city, you know, having um, office hours or coffee chats with students, especially at the counselors, the deans, so that, you know, your voice, your voice is heard and, you know, you can voice those resources. I mean, you can voice your concerns and get those resources. Um, in terms of um, even more mental health resources, there's always programming, especially at Northwestern, but you definitely want to talk to the schools and see what they're doing. Um, because you might get different answers. Maybe they'll say they'll prioritize it, but have no concrete examples. And maybe that's and maybe that's something that you should like look at. And so, you just want to ask as many questions as you can, just to get a sense of what student life would be. Um, and again, I will say this: so I'm blue in the face. Alumni, 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 because you can have a great conversation with maybe someone who represents the school, and not that they're misrepresenting anything, but I think you might get what that programming looks like in real time if you talk to a person who actually went through the experience, a student who had to experience it. Okay. Um, can we go to the next slide? Mm -hmm. I thought um, I just wanted to drop in here and just let you know, this is more for Andrew and Christina. Um, I just want to be mindful of time. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, guys. So we'll speed up a little bit. So tailoring your application strategy, you really want your personal statement to speak to why you want to go to that school, or it, maybe it's not your personal statement. There's other statements that they might ask you, a secondary statement, your diversity statement. Somewhere in your application, you want that we want them to know why you think you'd be a good fit for that program and why um, you'd be a good candidate. Yeah, I mean, just to add on a little bit, like, you know, you want to show your strengths. I mean, this is more granular and I feel like we can explain, but I think these definitely encapsulate the, the gist of it. But yeah, it definitely just depends on the school, you know, and I think that's important. Or, um, do you have anything else to add? Because, you know, I think this is fairly self-explanatory. No. 
We're good. All right. I'll go to the next slide then. Awesome. So yeah, the application timeline, I'll take this one because I wrote that was two long bullet points. <laughs> yeah, LSAT prep, you know, Juris does this, you know, start early. I took a gap year. I knew I was seeking one to improve my GPA. I started prepping in June 2022 to take the test in April 2023. It was great, but when I applied to September, I didn't have to worry about it. So I definitely recommend starting 18 months or so or before you plan to apply to law school. You know, give yourself some time to get your score up to where it needs to be. For deadlines, keep track of each school's timeline. And then early decision, you know, this is important. Strategize your submissions. When you look on the internet, you'll see all sorts of people. Like I, I know of one company that says, if you don't apply September, October, like when it opens, like you shouldn't apply at all. I know other resources say, if you apply in January or February, you're like on time. I think the reality is somewhere in the middle, depending on the school. You know, there's a great website called LSD.law, which I'm addicted to. It ha aggregates a lot of admission data. I think there's yeah. something like 30% of the admits for a lot of classes are on these pages, and most of it is pretty accurate. So it's a great resource. So if you play around with it, you'll find that some schools are, when, if you apply in September versus like January, like for example, Yale, they don't care when you apply. Other schools, you know, I'm not going to name names, but they tend to accept a lot of applicants early. And then if you apply after a certain point, it will disadvantage you. So, you know, some might disagree with what I'm saying, but I feel like based on the data we have, it's just good to get your applications in early. Obviously, you don't sacrifice quality. Like it's better to apply in October with a great application than in September with a rush one. But, you know, just if you're applying later, just, you know, understand that some schools you might get results that are a little bit out of sync with what you're expecting and then obviously for scholarships so it's definitely just making sure your application is good but i would say if you're applying to like january or february it could be tough i think that's really really becomes like a disadvantage for most schools so all right anything else christina or nope totally agree all right okay narrowing down your choices um, this is super important. I think you should definitely apply to, some, to safety schools where you're like, I'm confident I can get in. My GPA and LSAT are median or higher. Then you have your um, target schools. I'm sorry, your safety schools where your LSAT and GPA are higher than maybe the medians. And you have your target where it's just there. And then your reach where it's a little out of reach. But because you think you'd be a good fit, you're applying and kind of shooting your shot anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's good to have some of each um, and then go there. Again, all the priorities that we talked about earlier um, in this webinar, use those to refine your list and consider, again, location program, the culture of the school um, to kind of narrow that down. I yeah. did not apply to 50 schools. I would not suggest anybody to just do too much. I think refining it down to what makes sense in schools that you would go to works best. Mm -hmm. Andrew? Yeah, so I, I have a unique experience. I was a splitter, as it's known at admissions. I have a LSAT that's above most of the school's medians I applied to. My GPA was below all but one of them because I, I applied to all top 14 and then a scattering of top 20s. So, you know, what I will say is that some of the schools that I, I applied to were ones that I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to go, but for scholarship negotiations, it can be very helpful. Like, say you want to stay on the East Coast, you get into Berkeley with a big scholarship. Like, you can use that to negotiate with a Cornell or a Columbia, for example. So, like, that's the value. But, you know, def I would definitely just say keep it in a certain range. But, you know, I apply to schools. You know, I apply to Yale. I was never getting in, but you got to shoot your shot. And then there are other schools like, you know, my undergrad, Alabama. Like, your law school is good, but, you know. I didn't think I was going to go there, but they gave me a nice scholarship and, you know, it's good to have those options. So definitely don't limit yourself too much is what I would say. Good. I totally agree with the scholarship negotiation point. And I think having a high GP, a high LSAT, like the way you ha like that you have definitely pulls into that strategy. Mm -hmm. um, but that definitely comes in though, maybe a little bit yeah later when you kind of like are strategizing but that's yeah. a really good tidbit and, and really think about you know maybe negotiating so i did the same thing all right so i'm going to move on to the next slide and uh you want to take this one yeah think... um, i'm visiting law schools 
Um, if you can't make a, a effort to actually physically go see it in person, I definitely think that you should try and go to the different webinars that they host. Try to, you know, um, get some FaceTime with an admissions counselor. They tend to have events. Schools tend to have events that they'll send if you are, if you kind of sign up for their list serve, they'll send you events they might be having in your city if they're the same city or um, online. And just try your best to go because I. Law schools will see, okay, this person's interacting with us, mm -hmm. um, and that will be favor favorable in your application. Um, but if you can visit in person, I think that's maybe your best bet because you get to actually mm -hmm. see where you will be. I applied during COVID, so I didn't visit in person. So maybe, I don't know if Andrew is in the process of visiting or what that looks like for you. Maybe you have more to say. So, yes, I am visiting Cornell um, in April and Georgetown, I think, the week after this. So I'm right in the thicket of it. Um, that last bullet point I added because I didn't realize the extent of this until I visited Alabama law because I was in town for a football game, you know, just visiting friends. And I also go to law school. When I was there, the dean, I mean, I Southern hospitality is great, but they were really trying to pull me in. And it's like, I was asking them questions about employment statistics and they were giving me somewhat answers that I, I consider to be a little bit evasive and not a more half truths and accurate and that's what these schools do these tours are there for them to you to get to get you to go so you don't want to go to a school i would recommend not visiting until after you get an offer i know it's really tough but the, the risk of falling in love with school from some really kind and you know generous like admissions officer tour guide can be substantial just depending on the type of person you are and if you listen if you're not the type of person that like is swayed by that then great but just know yourself and just make sure that you're, you know, it's something to consider for sure. You know, they, they pitch it really, really hard depending on the school, at least in my experience. So I, I think it's just something to keep in mind. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Making the okay. final decision. Yeah, I can take this slide. So. Okay, go ahead. Um, yeah. So uh, final decision. So yeah, evaluating offers, the financial aid, the program strengths and the personal fit. Yeah, as we're going or earlier, you want to go to a place that's hopefully not too expensive and get you a job you want and, you know, either to feel you're interested now or something you might be interested in later and something where that you're, you fit well in, an area that you enjoy, you know, considering your career goals and networks, that's really important too. You want to go somewhere, again, that can get where you need to go. Um, and yeah, trusting your instincts. Like some people, they, Cornell is my example. They know they'd be miserable in a rural area or some place like Ithaca. Then you don't need to go to Cornell. You can go to somewhere like NYU, you know, in a city. So it's like that, that, you know, and if that's something that will materially impact your performance in law school, like if you think that you just get so bored and so isolated that your grades are dropping or you have a harder time seeking out opportunities, then that is absolutely something to consider. Awesome. No, Q&A. All right. Good time. Hello, I am back. Hi, folks. So first off, Andrew, Christina, fantastic, fantastic, fantastic job. Um, our audience has been really engaged and they've asked some really awesome questions. Right. So I think we'll start with the first one and I'll let you both have the floor and sort of answer as you see fit. Mm -hmm. So how do you suggest we connect and talk to the alumni from these schools? How do we genuinely foster these connections? Great question, Kennedy. I think it's double-sided. You can reach out to the school. They have an alumni network. Um, now that I'm graduating, I, there's a lot of questions. Are you interested in connecting with um, future students? So you can always reach out to the school and ask them to connect you with an, an alum, especially if you've applied or if you're, especially if you've gotten into the school. On the other side, um, I the way I did it, I went on LinkedIn and looked up people who maybe went to my undergrad or like, you know, from my same city or someone who's doing the kind of work that I'm interested in or did some of the things that I thought I might be interested in and just sent them a message and said, hey, I'm thinking about this school. I would love to hear about your experience. And I've gotten very, very um, good answers. People typically respond. Um, I've, you know, I've gotten phone, I've, um, phone calls, Zoom calls, coffees, people who have given me so much advice that I still use and I have gotten so many opportunities just from talking to them because they just have such a wealth of resources. And in terms of fostering those 
connections. It's just about, you know, meeting those people. And, and if you generally connect, it's going to continue. They're going to say, oh, hey, like, feel free to reach out to me with any more questions. And, and you can totally do that to continue to foster it. Some people you'll reach out to, it'll just be like, okay, thank you so much um, for your insight. And maybe you don't talk to them again. You're going to meet so many people. I would foster the connections with people. Who, or it's just like a more of a genuine connection, someone, you know, who you feel like you can definitely um, continue to talk to. And I would also say, um, um, reach out to people who are alums, but reach out to people who are maybe in their third year, or like their second year, because they might, they're not as busy as maybe a 1L in their third year, but they'll also have like some really good insight um, to tell you. And so my vehicle was, was LinkedIn. Andrew? Yeah, just, uh, I think Christina, to be frank, she's definitely more devoted to me through a process of like reaching out to people on LinkedIn. I, I didn't do that. Um, I primarily use the internet, you know, they are good resources. Um, I'll type them in the chat, but the law school admission mm -hmm. subreddit, they have AMAs or ask me anything about people who go to the school. I've definitely utilized them. Obviously, you know, it's, it's hard to verify, but I think generally most of them are accurate. I don't think people like, spend time making up going to the school and answering specific questions. Um, there's another one called toplawschools.com. I think it's the link. They, they tend to be a bit more frank and, and blunt, but you know, if you, this is especially important for employment prospects. Like you'll see every year there'll be like threads about people going through on-campus interviewing or people applying for clerkships or public interest jobs from a certain school. So if you get in and like, you know, if you're maybe not so comfortable, you don't know many people who go there, that could be a resource too, to at least have a jumping off point. Um, but yeah, everything Christina said is, is definitely accurate. You know, I know a lot of schools I've gotten into have also given me the phone numbers of students, or if you ask them, they'll have, will probably allow you to talk to a student too. Is that, right. So that would be helpful. You know, I don't know, I've never done it, so I don't know how like biased they are, you know, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe it'll be, you know, maybe they'll give you like, Hey, I don't know if I'm like, I don't know, but that's definitely something to consider as well. Okay, next question. Next question. So somebody asked about, oh, lost the question. Um, what about 100% online law schools? So, um, I guess we can start it off. So, to be honest, like that's something that I don't have a lot of experience in. I don't know how ubiquitous they are and what kinds of programs they are. Yeah, as we like, as I've said, like I think the best thing to do is just sort of, you know, as anything else, try to find alumni, try to research on the internet, like beyond rankings. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just don't know of any online programs and and what they're like, but I think everything sort of applies. But for that, I think generally an in person program would be better because you have all the in person networking and opportunities that you just don't get at an online school. You know, just like classmates professors etc but you know if it's something that you're not paying anything for it could be a little bit of a different story but i think that's the extent of my knowledge yeah I, I don't really have too much experience with online schools and from what i understand i think most of the online programs are like llm programs where you've already had a law school program or msl but i think Getting to know your classmates is one of the most important parts of law school and your professors. They will be your legal, your first base legal community moving forward. So unless you have a really strong reason, I personally would not suggest going to an online law school. And especially if you're like paying sticker price for it, I think going in person gives you the real bang for your buck because you get to meet people, you get to, it's more collaborative in that sense. And I did, uh, some virtual law school my first year starting in 2021 and it was not the best experience um and that and i wasn't in the online program it was just you know because of, of covid and it just it was frustrating in a lot of ways um especially and then and then you just don't have that connection that you would typically have and so i would suggest that you maybe look at more in-person programs unless there's like some, you know, huge reason. Amazing. So we are just up, well, almost at the hour. I do see a couple of questions coming in. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like we'll be able to get to all of them today. Um, I see one question about LSAT prep. 
Um, I think I took test masters. Andrew, what did you take? I used a bunch of resources. The, 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 I like the most is LSAT Demon. I think they're great. Um, I shoot it for jurors. It's high on this call. So hit me up, I guess, you know, reach out. <laughs> to um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm a tutor as well. But yeah, I think, you know, outside of that, you know, I liked LSAT Demon in Seven Stage. I would get a Law Hub subscription so you can take practice tests and not just be limited to the 60 of you for free. It's only 115 bucks, but you get it for a whole year and it helps you when you're applying too. Um, beyond that, it's just what's worked for you. Setting a good schedule. Um, I, I can't get all into all of it right now, but those are the yeah. basics. Um, and maybe one last one from Anthony. It says that you want to go to a school that like has other specialties and interests. I think this is what we were talking about in terms of clinics. Um, so at Northwestern, I'm in an immigration clinic. I will not be practicing immigration law, but I have been to court several times. One of my clients just got asylum um, a few weeks back. Um, and I know people who are doing juvenile justice, um, so many different types of law. So even if you, you know, you're know you working in civil rights now, but there are other clinics like entrepreneurship law clinics, corporate counsel practicum clinics where you can do different types of law. And that's one way to kind of dip your toes in um, and worrying about what schools have internships and practicums and clinics that might give you the opportunity to kind of try everything before you graduate. Feel free to email me um, any questions. I don't know if the Jewish will give out our contact information um, at the end of this, but I'm happy to talk more. We'll make it happen. Awesome. <laughs> we'll make it happen. Um, okay, so I, there's a ton of questions in here and I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to all of them today. I, of course, want to be mindful and respectful of everybody's time including our wonderful panelists here. Um, we do offer free personalized one-on-one -on -one consultations. They're about 20 minutes. Um, plugging that in there because there's a ton of questions in here and you can get as nitty and gritty in these consultations as you like, um, especially the ones that have a, uh, there's a couple of really personal questions in here about the LSATs and all of that. So that's a really great free resource. Um, we also have a ton of other free resources, whether it's study tips, uh, study schedules, and even some, uh, LSAT prep questions in there. So I highly encourage everyone to check that out. Uh, Christina, Andrew, thank you very much for being a part of this. Um, we appreciate you and your wonderful knowledge and, and best of luck in the near future. I know you both of you are going to do some really amazing things. And to our wonderful audience, we'd love to hear from you. Let us know your thoughts. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this webinar. And of course, we have a ton more coming up. So definitely suggest signing up for those. Awesome. With that, with that being said, I hope everyone has a wonderful Friday and happy International Women's Day. <laughs> bye, everyone. Yeah, bye. Take care, Thank everyone. You.